Alrighty, so this is uh, General Counsel for September 12th, and uh, I'm just filling in till Chief Hill arrives here this evening. And so to start off the agenda, we uh, do we have any additions to tonight's agenda? One from Councillor Johnson. Any others? Hearing none, do I have someone who's willing to move the agenda? Moved by Nathan, second by Audrey. All in favor? The agenda is passed. Okay, this evening we have three delegations, so I'm going to jump right in and welcome our first delegation. It's uh, Canada's proposed Indigenous health legislation, and this is Clarissa. So welcome, Clarissa. I swear she was on there. Claire, yes. Okay, so Claire, um, I'm going to give you the floor to do your brief presentation, and then we will ask questions and, and go from there. Okay? Great, Welcome. thank you. I'm just going to pass it to Zach real quick, just to do a little preface, and then I'll take it back. Thank you. Uh, yeah, good evening, Chief Counsel and community. Uh, as you know, I'm our Executive Director of Planning, Performance, and Evaluation. Um, just a brief uh, background again of the portfolio for the CEO team. So we support the needs of the pop of the organization to be more strategic, improve capacity to evaluate and understand the needs of our population, improve program planning and advocacy for service funding, as well as to ensure that the services being delivered are achieving their intended outcomes and impacts. Uh, and we primarily do this work through the gathering, analyzing and synthesizing of data from the organization and community. Uh, so Claire here on the call is one of my staff, and she's our strategic advisor and systems analyst within the portfolio. Um, she's going to be leading the presentation for the evening. Uh, and we also have Jesse Gartshore on the line. And as you know, she is our acting director of health services. Um, so thank you for having us. And I will hand it over to Claire for the presentation. Thank you. Um, so I prepared a PowerPoint. Just bear with me while I pull that up. Okay, are you able to see the screen without notes? Yes, all is good. Thank you. First try. Okay, um, so I am here to bring some information on the Canada's um, proposed Indigenous health legislation. I'm sure, we have heard lots about this lately. Um, so I wanted to bring this information in a way that can support an informed position. Um, so an agenda for this presentation. First, I'll just go a little overview of myself for those of you who don't know me, um, and then give an overview on the current work that has happened um, that the federal government has proposed with this legislation so far, um, and then kind of provide some clarity on update on activities from all the different stakeholders. So ISC and Chiefs of Ontario and AFN and kind of try to differentiate the work um, that's being done across these different areas. And then, as I said, support uh, developing a unified and informed position. Um, I also wanted to um, set the stage with some intended goals. Um, so I know that some of you have been present for some of these conversations more than others. So I just wanted to be sure we can kind of bring us all to the same level of understanding when it comes to the proposed legislation. Um, so just acknowledging we're all coming from different areas. So I apologize for anyone who might be hearing some information for the second time, um, but just really wanna have a goal of uh, closing any existing knowledge gaps and fostering open dialogue. Okay, so welcome to me. Um, I've worked with some of you, I've spoken with many of you and met most of you, um, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is Claire. Uh, Clarissa is my full name. Um, everybody calls me Claire. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about um, myself because I think our identities and lived experiences can create certain biases and how we interpret and view the world. So just reflecting on my own position in relation to Six Nations allows me to be better at understanding how my position within like the social hierarchy of the community can broaden or uh, like restrict my understandings. Um, 
So I have been working in the community now for just about two years. Um, previously, which you might have seen on the agenda, I was working as a policy analyst um, with Six Nations Health Services. So that was my second position after grad school. Before that, I was working at a not-for-profit focusing on Northern Ontario as a policy analyst. Um, so prior to this, I got my master's in political science from Guelph, um, and I do not have any Indigenous heritage, but I did grow up um, really close to six, so I've always considered myself a friend. I personally just don't like the word ally. Um, but just to share a little bit, my broad goals kind of in my role um, and in my previous role as well are to assist the community in achieving community-driven goals uh, by sharing knowledge about the internal and external kind of governance structures. Um, I have been and continue to be bringing external knowledge of these um, like external systems and how they operate to kind of figure out how to best manipulate them and get what's needed um, for Six Nations of Grand River community members. Um, so while also making sure to practice consistent reflexivity. Okay, so now getting into the content. Um, some of you may already be familiar again with some of these terms, but just want to define some that will be referred to later in the presentation and can often be quite um, mixed up with other terms and um, also used by the federal government in a way that is not matching its true definition. So firstly, legislation. Um, legislation is often referred to as the acts, and this is forms of law that can provide authority to make regulations. So these are quite often easily enforceable. Um, in contrast, a policy will outline what a government or organization intends to achieve and how they can do that. Um, can be more difficult to enforce and hold policymakers accountable, but um, allows more flexibility and intentions can change over time. Um, and then similarly, a draft, a bill is like a draft form of a proposed law. Um, so typically when it's in a stage of a bill, consultation has not happened. <laughs> um, so co-develop, I'm sure we've been hearing lots of this word lately from ISC um, and FINIB, but it means that this is, sorry, Canada's definition, just to be clear but they define it as Indigenous partners and the government of Canada working together through a collaboration process to reach mutual agreement on legislative options for proposed distinction-based Indigenous health legislation. And then distinctions-based, again, this is Canada's definition, acknowledges that each community has a unique culture, territory, history, and relationship with the government of Canada as well as unique strengths to build on and challenges to face. So a distinction-based plus approach means working independently with First Nations peoples, Inuit, Métis peoples, and intersectional peoples in recognition of their unique attributes. And then lastly, measures. Um, so in the context of Canadian legislation, measures means actions, regulations, policies, or provisions that are taken or implemented by the government to address certain issues. I thought you were, excuse me, uh, Claire. Yes. Yeah, ahead, Audrey has a question. Yes. Go ahead, Audrey. Something about the co-sectional people. Back a slide or two. Yes. Please and thank you. No problem. Uh, the distinctions based definition at the very end there, I think. Here. Yeah, intersectional peoples. Who are they? Um, Another group formed? So that is in my own assessment. They are referring to uh, like organizations. Um, and I'll get into it a little bit further in a couple of slides, but during a lot of engagement, they um, engaged with not like community level um, 
like ignoring that nation to nation kind of respect and going to thing, uh, organizations like AFN, but then also friendship centers um, and really not community driven organizations. So I don't know, you'd have to ask them, but my interpretation is that um, they added that to make their, uh, I added that afterwards to make their approach make more sense. Does that answer your question? For now. Okay. Okay, Claire, you can carry on. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so now getting into the introduction of the health legislation. So on January 28, 2021, the Minister of ISC publicly launched the co-development of in um, distinctions-based Indigenous health legislation. Sorry, the name has changed a couple times. Um, and the speech from the throne in 2020 um, was said to be kind of like the caveat for this. So in response to that, ISC said this um, exact quote, these three um, points here on the screen, word for word, that the Indigenous health legislation is an opportunity to establish overarching overarching principles as a foundation of federal health service for indigenous peoples support the transformation of health service delivery through collaboration with indigenous organizations and the development provision and improvement of services to increase indigenous led health service delivery and lastly continue to advance the government of canada's commitment to reconciliation and a renewed nation to nation inuit crown and government to government relationship with indigenous peoples based on the recognition, rights, respect, cooperation, and partnership. So again, this is um, directly from ISC. So how do they say that they're doing this? Um, they claimed that they are fully uh, committed to implementing Joyce's principle um, and ensuring that it guides the work of this legislation to support access to high quality and culturally appropriate services. Um, so just for anyone who isn't aware, Joyce's principle was created after the death of Joyce Echewan in 2020 at a hospital in Quebec due to systemic racism that led to her death. Um, the community created a policy type uh, statement that turned into Joyce principle um, where they were essentially calling governments to act and end systemic racism. So that is kind of like stemming for how this had all started. So just to go over a little bit because a lot has happened since 2020 now um, and I'm going to try to outline the process as easily as possible because it has not been a linear or easy to understand process. Um, so, so far, ISC has outlined the process into these five stages here. So first is engagement. And again, that started in 2021. Um, and then leading up to the very last stage uh, where the government of Canada is planning to introduce this bill to parliament in winter 2024, which is now quite close. Um, so I'm going to break it down. Yeah, go ahead. No, I just... I. I see co-analysis and I see co-development. I just wondered what happened to co-drafting because I think um, that's really important. I know when we were at the Chiefs of Ontario, a lot of the Chiefs were bring, mentioning that about we need to be co-drafting the bill as well. Yes. Helen, that is a great point. Um, I'll kind of like break down sections uh, in a moment, but um, sorry, I'm just organizing many thoughts in my mind. Okay. But you are correct, and they have never claimed to use co-drafting. Co-drafting has been terminology that um, has been asked for like at the community level, and I'm going to go over it. But basically, the parliamentary process doesn't allow for co-drafting. It's not a possibility. So I want to kind of try to highlight how this process and if legislation is going to go forward it has to go through 
parliament, which means it has to be drafted by the Department of Justice. Unless they're going to like go back and change massive legislation, which we know they're not going to do, then that's just something to really keep in mind. Um, so I hope that answers your question preliminary. But if you still have that question in a couple slides, Helen, please uh, bring this back up for sure. Okay. Does that answer your question, Counselor? Pardon? Did that answer your question, sorry, uh, yeah. Counselor? Yeah, she answered my question. I'm not okay. happy with the answer, but. Okay, well, uh, we'll like to get to it in the coming slides as well. Okay, Audrey, can you turn your mic off? I have another question from Hazel. <laughs> yes, could you please clarify for me uh, before we go any further? Is this whole process taken on health transfer for Six Nations? Um, that is a good question. So no, um, technically they are two separate things um, and they kind of have been tending to go similar ways. So I totally understand um, that kind of thought. And I think what is, important to take away is like the preliminary answer is no because the legislation has not really like no no information has been shared with us on on the content and that is one of the concerns um so with that there hasn't been any indication of intentions of that but that doesn't necessarily mean that wouldn't be the case i hope but that know, answers your know question how the government works and that's exactly what they're doing here we're just taking all of this information and the word that they're not using is transfer, but they're calling it transformation. That should um, send flags flying into the sky. And if they didn't even include the indigenous people to be a part of all of this development that they're at, at this point, we all need to be on guard. I think you need to get the, the truth before you go any further with the idea myself. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Those are really good points. So we and, have some oh, yep. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yes, under health legislation background, it says ISC has claimed to be fully committed to implementing Joyce's principle. Does that mean they're not fully committed? They're just claiming it? How does that work? Um, well, the legislation hasn't been developed yet. So I, that's just my way of saying, like, this is a promise that they're making, but there's nothing that has happened up to date to hold them accountable to that. And we haven't seen the legislation already down into, like, that uh, third, third phase of the arrow. Sorry, give me one moment. Like we're already that far down and we don't know what it's going to include. So that is a major concern. Does that? Thank you. No problem. My question is similar to um, Councillor uh, Melba and Councillor Hazel. The federal government, provincial government, they take all of their lead from AFN. I see in here that KU. Chiefs of Ontario have not uh, taken uh, the same path as AFN. When the last lady was here to discuss health, she basically said they did a lot of um, engagement among First Nations in Canada. And they did, <laughs> AFN was the major one that they they said that they interviewed and gotten, uh, did engagement with. So I believe that the legislation outline and probably a lot more than that has already been created. They're asking us for our input. They're basically saying that we have an exemption, but they say they will never um, extend the time. We need, we, that's what we said last time, we need more time to um, work with our entire community to find out what our community wants. And it seems like time is running out. So that's one thing. And um, I think it's a very um, 
dangerous to go without having it thoroughly understood and what we want. And I think we have to ask our community sooner than later. And um, AFN does not speak for us, mm -hmm. nor does she use Ontario. So we have to do that speaking for ourselves, but we have to also have time to engage with our community. So the only way I used to we do that is we have an extension. And they say the only people who can um, make laws here are the lawyers. So they get your, your information and then you're shut out of constructing the laws, putting having input into the law, all the rest of that. So that's not very good, but they have their rules that they're following and that's how we're gonna get jammed up here. Yeah. Well, yeah, now, is, now as well, uh, Councillor, on that, I, I think that is definitely our position as well that you have just stated. Um, we definitely align with that as uh, you being Chief and Council. Um, and, and I think as well with the purpose of this meeting is to be able to share more information as well too, so that uh, Council is well informed on this situation. And uh, our hope is uh, for ourselves not to be taking a position, but to be able to inform uh, Council to be able to take a position uh, within this legislation. So. Um, like Claire mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, a number of items will likely be items that you're already aware of, but we just wanted to bring it as much as we know on the table um, so that you are informed the way that we are as well too with this matter, because there are some very time sensitive uh, decisions likely coming up over the next month. Uh, and again, that's a bit of the purpose of Claire trying to share as much of this information as she's able to um, so that we can align ourselves in a, a better strategic process as well. So okay, we're here to support as much as we're able. So I think actually we could spend a full day talking about this and this is what we should do. Um, I think we've all read the presentation, but before we go into next steps, um, I see Greg and then Sherry Lynn. Greg? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, thanks, Claire, for the um, for the information again. Um, as you, uh, I think I was uh, had the uh, pleasure of sitting with you and Alana at the AFN uh, when this legislation was brought forth, that it did seem to be that the AFN seemed to be leaning towards the in the direction of accepting this this legislation, which, um, as uh, as everyone has stated, that we weren't really uh, we weren't consulted on this, and it, to me, it lacked a lot of specifics. It lacked a lot of. Uh, I think uh, it didn't address a lot of the specific needs um, to certain areas of the of the indigenous healthcare, and also it didn't address a lot of our needs. So, and again, I I, I know it's time sensitive. Uh, I don't think we should be uh, pressured into uh, making hasty decisions, especially without um, without due process in terms of. Uh, Consult consultation with our community as well, and also our our healthcare our healthcare system, and how it operates, and all of some of the the problems that we see, which which I don't think would be addressed in this legislation. Yeah, thanks. Any comment re response to Greg's comments? Uh, no. I'll okay. go. Um, yeah, I, I agree with um, um, everybody else who's speaking. I guess uh, the part of it is is <laughs> these legislations that are coming down and how can we start bringing the community along with us? Because the, the more transparency and the more that the community understands what the government is bringing down the tube or what they want to implement, the, the better we're going to have the community on our side to to be able to, to fight this with us because we can't fight it alone. And it's not just this one, there's gonna be <laughs> a lot more that are that is coming. So the more we can um, really start getting it out to the community, uh, not just with this one, but all different legislations that are coming down is only gonna help us to be able to um, have the community's um, support behind us instead of um, not knowing. So I guess for me is I understand that you're going to send it to the community, but I think we really need to um, do that at all levels that are that um, is coming down um, just for them to to be aware and 
really understand it so they can um, stand behind us and uh, fight with us instead of um, just guessing or how come we didn't do anything? You know what I mean? Is really having, is trying to do something different, I guess I'm trying to say, and having them um, stand beside us instead of behind us. Thank you. Thanks. Nathan? Thanks, and, and good discussion. I think one thing we should absolutely do in the next little while is, is come up with a position. Um, because my understanding is this is going to drafting in the fall, whether we like it or not. Um, so it's it's going to be important how we kind of position um, ourselves and vis-a-vis and -vis kind of that transition into the next council too. I think the next council needs to see this very PowerPoint and go through this as well as part of the orientation because, you know, if they're sitting down in, in November, basically this this legislation is going to be drafted while the new council is starting, uh, starting their work. Um, I'm a little confused over AFN and Ku's positioning, but that's not new. Um, I, I think we really need to kind of um, look and zero in on some of these exemption clauses and see what they mean for us. Uh, because at the end of the day, um, I agree with everybody, this is going to hurt us. And I'm particularly concerned about the um, the funding models, the funding models that's going to come down where we're capped at a certain percentage. And now that I understand it more, not only are we capped at a certain percentage, but we get the money last. Um, you know, those that need it, they get it first. We're we're sitting here waiting, and we we get it last too. So capped, and and we have to wait on cash flow. Um, so. Uh, I, I like the analysis uh, in terms of that. I'm just wondering how we can quickly turn that analysis into uh, a position and get that in front of government rather quickly. Great, next steps, Nathan. And so on that note, can we move into that actual process? Yep. Okay, so Zach and Claire, I then expect that you would give us a date of when we'll all meet together. On those next steps yeah and i and i think part of this is um i mean this actual process itself is new to us i know that we've engaged with the chief's office on this in terms of drafting um a position statement so i'm not sure if that's the route we want to go or if we want it to be a more full discussion among the entire chief and council um but again i, I know there's a bit of time sensitivity with this to uh state our position uh because i, I believe they're looking for uh, comments on this by end of September, I believe it is. Yep. The federal okay. government is. So. Yeah, I think they come back next week. Right, Nathan? They sit. Okay. Audrey? But I think we're missing a key part of this, Zach, and that is the community. I mm -hmm. think someone should be uh, drafting a well-crafted survey or some form of getting uh, people's opinions on what it is that this system needs. What is it that's not working? Mm -hmm. What more services do we need? How, you know, there's a lot of lateral violence going on. So what are we doing to uh, to combat that? And there's lots of services that people don't, aren't aware of and uh, they should be aware of. So we better get a communication plan out there as well to inform our community what's available and who is there and what's the name of the program and what um, criteria do you have to meet in order to get into those programs? So I think we have to get the community's input and um, that's my suggestion, or do I have to make it a motion? Zach, tell me. No, that's a uh, great idea. I, I know that's uh, a part of the work that the health planning team has already done around what does the future of health services look like? What are the needs that communities identifying for healthcare in communities? So a lot of that uh, not a lot of it, but a, a good chunk of that work has already been done. But I think um, community feedback on the specific legislation, uh, I, I'm, I honestly don't know how much community does know about this legislation. So uh, we can work with the comms team on getting this information out so community is aware. Um, and then we can look at drafting uh, sort of a quick survey to be able to get out or some sort of data gathering method so that we can really understand community's uh, voice around this uh, specific legislation piece. Okay. Um, I, 
think this would be a good thing that we could add to our discussion when we do have it, because um, that's a very important point. And if an exclusion is the decision or whatever the decision is, an exemption or exclusion, then we still would need like, a OK, well, what are we going to do about it? And if it was through policy or anything like that, then that's, I think, when that really robust community engagement would kind of come in as if the community driven, like if uh, uh, Six Nations took it over and did it ourselves in a way. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Claire. I have Melva and then Greg and then we'll uh, and Helen. <clears throat> Some years ago, when <clears throat> Ruby was the director of health, hopefully this isn't a good dream that I'm talking about, but we marched at Parliament. The reason why we marched is we were marching to say that health is a treaty right. And I'm wondering if any research has been done in respect to that. Where does this come from? What treaty right is that that we have? So our needs, as was mentioned, need to be specifically looked at and understood and implemented through a treaty, if that is necessary. Thanks. Go ahead, Melba. Turn. Go ahead, Melba. Melba, you can turn your mic off. Go ahead, Greg. Uh, yeah, I just had a, a question for Claire. Uh, when we were at the AFN there, and uh, and when I when I stood up and uh, gave a very uh, blunt objection to this uh, legislation, and uh, thank you for the background information on that, um, there that really didn't uh, garner any type of response from the government, did it? It, you know, when we and I, I tried to give a the best type of uh, objection that I could at the time, and they did not. That just seemed to fall on deaf ears. And and to Nathan's point there, um, if we establish a policy that uh, I, I have a fe I have a fear that it may not be uh, looked upon very, um, I guess, very long in terms of the government size and to, to even even consider it. So, um, but I, I'm just trying to think right now what type of moves that we could make. Okay, other than in like for example, like you were saying, injecting. A uh, a clause where we can opt out, uh, and then we can get further, and then we can go back in after we've done further, you know, investigation and further consultation. But I don't know if again, I don't even know if that procedure will be accepted. And that's sort of what my question is, Claire. Are do you think the government is receptive to to something like that? Um. So sometimes political predictions are uh, impossible to make. Um, but I think like knowing everything that I do know, um, six, like a lot of communities look to six because, you know, we all know that the population is is so large. And so everybody just basically wants to say that they're serving the population to get more money. So I think like it, there's a lot of power in that way and it needs to sort of be, it could be used as leverage in a sense. Um, and if that's what is asked for, I think that there would also even be smaller communities who didn't have the capacity to get to that solution, kind of. Um, I know there have been smaller communities trying to consult with lawyers and things that are financially out of their reach or they're too busy or they can't find Indigenous law, Indigenous practicing lawyers, sorry. Um, so they just like lack the capacity. So my, I guess, desired outcome would be that others would follow suit. Um, and we already know that KU followed, uh, like took a big, big stance when they rejected the co-development. So the government seems to be surprisingly kind of receptive to that. Um, and they keep, they changed some deadlines and added some reports to try to seemingly sway KU. <laughs> um, so they are being receptive and that would be my best hope. So I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you. Okay, thanks, Greg. Over to Helen, and then Hazel, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, I was just going to tell uh, Jesse and Zach, you might want to go through uh, Lori Davis's archives, because I'm pretty sure she sent out a survey with all those health questions. The health has been working on transforming health for the past four years. So it's not nothing new to us, or it shouldn't be. 
And I'm pretty sure she did all that, different kinds of surveys when, to find out what it was. we Because I think I did one. I even remember I think I did one, but I could be wrong, of course. But you need to look through uh, the stuff prior to when Lori was there because I know she was doing that stuff. But I know it's hard for you guys because you're new and all that, but, you know, we had no sense of reinventing the wheel. Yeah, no, great, great point. Again, um, I even though I'm new in this role, I have been with I was with health services prior to this position for a, a number of years. So um, and actually worked closely with Lori on the previous health transformation work. So, uh, yeah, we do have uh, some of that information. Uh, like I said, it's still in process right now, even um, looking at what community wants for the future of healthcare and community. Um, but like I responded to Audrey, I think Great ideas, once again, and we will compile that as well as we uh, look to create this position. Uh, Jesse, I don't know if you have any additional comments to that at all. No, that, I mean, not really, Zach. I think um, it's a good point that that there we do have some information and, and we continue to gather that information. I think about the community health survey um, that's yep. that's in the works as well. And so that'll be additional information. And, and Sarah's been able to compile, our epidemiologist, Sarah Curley-Smith, has been able to compile some really good data that can help inform as well. So all great, great points. Thanks. And I will give it over to Hazel for the last comment. Yes, I'm just thinking that um, the Iroquois caucus has seven First Nations and that has become a stronger um, group who's addressing more and more topics all along. So I'm wondering if Six Nations drafted their own health uh, plan, shared it with uh, the Iroquois caucus, and um, that would make, I'm sure that those other Na First Nations would follow along with Six Nations. They do use them as sort of a um, somebody that they can follow along with rather than not following. So, um, and I'm saying this because the Chiefs of Ontario and the Assembly of First Nations appears to both be on their way out. They don't have any strength left. They just do whatever ISK tells them to do. They don't seem to come up with any good plan on their own. And um, therefore, I'm thinking that if Six Nations created their own health plan according to how they want it here with the people's input, and then shares it with the Iroquois Caucus, who are other First Nations who belong there. Um, it'll be a stronger document, and we can all hopefully have our own First Nations health plan for First Nations. Thanks. Thanks, <clears throat> Okay. Okay. So with that, um, I think Zach, Claire, Jesse, you understand the position of council, and the next steps that have to be done. Perfect. Okay, so with that, um, we'll just then, we don't need a motion to this, right, because we didn't follow through. Okay, so thanks everyone for presenting. Just a we'll uh, clarification, Councilor. Um, so I think what we're understanding on our end is that we'll draft our position uh, between ourselves and the Chief's office. Um, from that point, is this, is that something you want us to bring back to one of the council meetings for full council to review? Um, and then we can at least attach a, I guess, a BCR to it as well. Yes, as okay. well as reaching out. Okay. To Great. Okay. So we'll do that work over the next few weeks. Then. Okay. And one final question, Audrey. We had a presenter come in, um, and, and go through this health serve you with us and wanting us to be in, engaging with them. And she said that she used Six Nations health care system as mm -hmm. her backbone for going out to engage with. So I might want to offer you, Zach, and suggest that you may want to get ours, find out as much as you can about theirs and see how much was lifted. And um, so we kind of try and guide that into more of the Six Nations framework. Just a thought. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great discussion. I think we know where we're going. And so thanks, team. And we will hear from you in the next couple of weeks. Have a good evening. Okay. 
I would now like to uh, welcome our second delegation, Gawaniwo School. So who is presenting? Come on up into the middle and you can uh, use the mics. Awesome. All righty. Welcome, guys. We have your briefing note. It is uh, in regards to the school construction. So with that, over to you. The, the letter that was returned from the green and whatever that, do you all have that somewhere? Can that be put up there somehow? <laughs> okay, so in... Oh, the one that's the denial letter? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have that one, do you? Yeah. You need to send that one? Did you just call the chief executive coordinator? She can just go on the screen. The SBC. Hold on, I'm still trying to find it. I'm back to the briefing note. It was mentioned. Ruby's not here. Sorry. I'm Rosemary. I'm vice chair. Okay. Keep your hands up so we can hear it. And we only can hear it when I refer to them. Anyway, I'm Rose, Rose Miller. I'm vice chair. Uh, Ruby can't be here. Um, so myself and a few other board members and board secretary are here. Um, the briefing note was put out where she was wanting to know, um, as far as my understanding from her, was that the next steps and how do we access more funding for the school because we have to rent all these extra spaces as far as that briefing note is concerned. However, from what I was told, we were um, supposed to come here and say, what are the next steps? Because of this denial letter that we, we received from the Green and Inclusive, um, what was it? Green and Inclusive Program, program yeah. to, um, to build the school, to fund the school building. Um, they've denied us. And in that letter, it states that there is no other avenue that we can access to apply for funding, for further funding. So we wanna know what your next steps are. Mind you, we did see Mark today. He was there with Patty Hadju. They are both aware of this. We also had a meeting with um, Chris Rowe today at three. He is aware of this and they are aware of this. Um, Nobody has any answers. Nobody has any, well, I can't say they don't have any answers. Um, Chris Rowe flat out said that um, there is no funding available and they don't know we're on their radar is all he said. So just quickly, my name is Arnold Jacobs Jr. I'm a board member of the Gonio School. Um, so yeah, there, there was a lot said today to the people that we she just mentioned, but just to bring it up so you have a reference what we're talking about, what was that email again? E-S-C-T-U-T-R-D-O-O-R-D-I-N-A-T-O-R at S-I-X-N-A-T dot C at six stations dot C. So yeah, it's in the letter, it just, you can bring it up here. <clears throat> so there was a lot said to those people today that, you know, they didn't like to hear the words that we had to say. Um, but, you know, Aunt Rupe, she can't be here because she's on medical hiatus right now. But she's the one that, you know, approached or wanted us to approach council and ask, use with this letter that's going to be displayed. What are you going to do to help us address these departments or this department specifically? I think, and he has seen it. She's on that email, and so is Audrey. So they're aware of it. But if the rest of you could see it. <laughs> Yeah, so it just 
this the one part that basically is brought up for the denial is that third paragraph where it says, please know that all assessment results are final and that the program parameters governing the GICB program do not permit Infrastructure Canada nor the Ministry of Intergovernment Affairs, Infrastructure and Communities to approve projects which do not meet all eligible, eligibility requirements. So this was a letter that Mike Mentor had received back because he's the one that submitted this application on our behalf. So <clears throat> like we said, we met with this new minister, Patty Idu, and she didn't like what I had to say this morning. I uh, asked her straight up, you know, is this going to be another lip service show, you know, another minister showing up here, making promises and then walk out the door thinking you're, you know, making us think we're going to get money next. I told her, you know, you've been behind the scenes this whole time. You know what we require. She didn't like to hear that. She was ready to leave, but Mark, you know, took her on a tour anyway. So same with this Chris fella, you know, we had to remind him of, of our um, Six Nations history. Um, I'm talking about dollars being allotted here for over five year span for infrastructure stuff, but you know, I had to remind him too that Canada was built on our dime. You know, there's no way we should be sitting here with our hand out. You should be just handing it over, not us begging for it. So he didn't have too much to say about that either. So we're here as a board to ask you as council, what are you going to do about this letter? And that's our question. Okay, thanks. So I have Audrey and then Hazel. Okay, my first question is, what did um, Mike say about the eligible, eligibility requirements that were not met? Do you know what they are? No. So there's the first step. Somebody needs to email Mike and say, what did you miss? What didn't we do? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we actually sent, we sent two eligible letters or attestation letters. Kale Martin assembled two of them yep. and, and sent them to them. And this is her response. And this was Mark Miller's promise of assembling a team to help us on the other side to make sure this application would go through and get approval. So we thought we had everything checked out, but here they are giving another loophole, another hoop to jump through over that little attestation letter. As for Mike, he hasn't contacted us. We had, during our meeting today with Chris, Jennifer actually had to contact Mike to get him on the meeting, the team's meeting, to add, and Chris had to ask him what his role was in it. Other than that, he answered that, said he assembled it, said that we handed in these two tenders and everything that was there, and then he quickly left the meeting. So I think it still has to be fun of what it is because they're denying you on something that you don't even know what you got denied on. Again. Mike is not one that, even though he's been in meetings where he's been directed by a few council members here to keep in contact with the board, that's something that he hasn't done oh, through on. Yes. Okay, there's one thing we need to do is we need to meet with Mike and we need to also find out what are the things that were missed or were they missed? Yeah. yeah. that was needed for this they responded to us in in writing we got correspondence back and that they did meet we did meet all of the requirements for this funding so why it never went through that's beyond us you're probably talking to different people that's one of their strategies they use the one thing that we did we did have kale martin do is they compiled a 200 and some odd 263 page summary of everything they've done to send to these people. And as to my knowledge, as far as I know, nothing's been sent back. 
I know that every place that Mark goes and that counselors go, we always ask for help for governing a school to be built. So maybe it's got to be a more direct political uh, plan in order to do that and to set up some meetings. And Christopher would be the person doing that, setting up meetings for the chief and council. And that's one thing that we can do. And the other stuff, we would have to have our finance people here. And I don't see anybody here. So it's going to have to be, see what other options are open. Hey, do you know me? Bridge loan? Okay. Yeah, one second. Are, are you done, Audrey? Yeah, because I think we... There you go. I think we do need to have that uh, that um, financial stuff looked at. We're, there has to be a way of raising as much money as we can uh, to help them. But we need to know where there are some envelopes of money, if there are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Diesel? First of all, the letter that was sent out to all of us, that would be us four councillors who are supposed to be representing council on the Gawaneo Building Committee. That letter was so specific, it, it was like a layout from start to finish. And the attestation part that they completed spelled out everything. So there was nothing left undone. There was nothing left undone. And then for to get a letter that says you can't ask any more questions, there's something fishy about that. I think they're going to keep saying no. It, it don't matter how many times that you fill out an application and ask for funding for this school, they're going to keep saying no. They started saying no when the school first asked for funding, and I think at that time it was around $12 million. Next time they asked, it was up to around 18. And then 20 something, now it's up to 30. So that pattern is telling everybody that they have no intention. And they keep saying, oh, you're this number on the list. They keep fluctuating their list, whatever way the wind's blowing. I'm gonna suggest to council now that in order to deal with, the property is already set to have construction start that this council back a loan from a bank. The banks are willing to give them a loan. It's just us who have to be in approval of it to um, co-sign for them. That's the fastest way. And I've talked to Mark about this and he has also said, and I said, why don't we just not send 30 million to the government of the GRE money, tax money that they submit, just give it to Gawaneo and let them start building next week. There's two good options, either that or the other one, but we need to be firm in our stance and say, okay, this is what we're going to do now because all of that work that's been done there and the winter's coming on, it could ruin some of the infrastructure that's already there. You know, like the the what is that, Bob? What do you call all that stuff we did? It's all like the sewer system in in service, like underground. Besides servicing. Everything's done. The water line, the sewer line, natural gas line. It's all under the ground, sticking up in the right places, ready to roll. You know, that and that's part of what Kevin has prepared. And now that that's where that two million dollar came from. That's what we put it into to get it rolling so that we're not looking back anymore. We're just gonna move forward. So that's what it all is. I'm afraid if we, it's just like somebody that starts to build a house, they put their basement in and it sits there and goes to pot. We don't want that to happen. Council's already invested two million into that site servicing. Everything is a, a go now, just put the building up and the quickest way we can do it is to co-sign, get a loan and or else hold 30, million back from the GRE, GRE funds. And I'll make that a motion if you need a motion. Thanks. Can you turn your mic off, please? Okay. 
we need to take that actually to a finance committee. <laughs> but uh, yeah, okay, I have Helen and Greg. Well, I I wasn't at the, I know there was a meeting not too long or something, but I read the Turtle Island News and I'm going to tell you what I read. That the man, I don't even know who the man was, he was some government man, and he said, the only reason they're not building a school is because it's not a band operated school. That's why they're not giving you money. And he said if they've turned into a band operated school, they could probably make it money for it. But I think it was Jeremy Green. Is his name Jeremy Green? Works down there. He said they didn't want to be a band operated school. So that's an option. I know you don't want to hear it, but it's an option to be a band operated school. That's so if it becomes a band operated school, would that mean, because I don't want to lead our people into uh, taking over education. So if it becomes a band operated school, is that what it does? I don't I don't know what they mean. As far as I know, they just mean a band operated school probably because it's a private school. It needs to be, that needs to be looked at before yes. that happens. We what would it so mean? To say it's a band operated school if it's going to take us down a road that our people don't want to go down. Well, I'm just you, you're you're here no, looking for um, yeah you're here looking for options. I just mentioned and this is one option. It is an option, and it's up to you guys if you want to do it. But like she said, I think we'd have to look more into what does it mean and how does it work and stuff like that. But that's what that's what the guy said. He's the first person ever said that. Out of all the times you've been traveling all over and sending all of these position papers and these. Letters. This is the first man that ever said they weren't going to fund it because it wasn't a band operated school. Those other people didn't have the balls to tell you that, but that's why they're doing this. Patty today, Patty had you. She she didn't have the balls to tell you we're not going to do it because it's not a band operated school. So you're right. We got to look at options, and I I was gonna I was got it written on my paper. This is what Hazel said about. Grand River Enterprise, take, see if we can get the money and just use it and tell the government we're using it. You're not getting it, but that, that would take a lot of discussion. Okay, thank you, Helen. So I see a number of hands. Um, so I'm going to go down in the order that I have. So Greg, you're up next. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you um, to uh, to our guests to to bring this to light. The yeah, we uh, we had a little quick little meeting before. Uh, Minister Haydu went over to the school, uh, and again the excise tax uh, subject came up. Uh, uh, we talked quite at length about it, and uh, one of the things was that was that, was the need for the Galileo School for the funding, and uh, she seemed to be quite receptive to uh, seeing that if there was some way that there would be some type of, of formula that we could get that excise tax money. She's just seemed to be receptive as all of these ministers are. But as far as uh, commitment, she did say that uh, there was a, she didn't seem to be, she didn't say she had money in, in the education budget to, to fund the school. She did gave no commitment that way, but we did speak length at this, uh, the uses or the use of this, this excise tax. And uh, she did seem to be quite receptive to that. I think, Christopher, you could probably chime in on this. There was also the infrastructure bank or something else, which we didn't seem to want to go down. We were asked, we were pushing that excise tax to be used specifically for uh, all of these, all of these buildings and structures that we need. And that, uh, and she did seem to be receptive in that, in that light. But where it goes, as everyone knows, We'll we'll just we'll have to see. Thanks, Greg. Nathan. Yeah, I'm I'm along the lines of hey, so I think I think we got to start flexing some muscle um, as it relates to this current government, the the Liberal government. Today was a little wonky. I had I had this information prior to, I think I would have given her a little bit more of my ear um, in terms of the preparation, even for for. Those types of meetings, having uh, a very important minister in the community, and and you know not being able to address issues like this, is is kind of problematic. But that's for us to fix. 
Um, the one thing to, uh, the only thing I'll add to, to kind of what's already been said is there's an interesting tool we should start using because I'm now looking at the letter and I see where the BS comes in when it says the zero carbon building design standard version three or be exempt from that. Nobody can get around that. That's one of their, their tactics that they use. It's hard to get around and they do exempt, but that exemption has to come from the minister. So my suggestion also is I think we got to get the Auditor General, we got to get their tools and their systems involved in this. Their watchdogs looking at what government is doing on this particular file, not just send them this letter, send them all the proposals, everything that's been done to the Auditor General's office so that they can hold their own bureaucrats to account. Because I agree with you, Hazel, I think there's something fishy. Um, and the best tool that they have is using their own tools against them. So I'll just offer that for now. Yeah, I'm going to make a, a resolution so there will be something concrete that we arrive at this evening. So I'm going to suggest that Six Nations withhold, ask GRE to submit $30 million for this school ASAP. That's my first motion. And if I can get a seconder, then we can start moving on that. And then the second motion that I want to put forward is we could also uh, send a request to our finance department to look into co-signing for a bank loan. So we'll have two, two options that we can decide, whatever comes up. And I'm sure both of them are going to agree. I'm just putting it out there that we have those two resolutions to show that tonight we've made a commitment that we're going to do something. And like Nathan said, we need to get strong with this First Nation because of the denial that we keep getting from from the government on everything. Thank you. So can you clarify that, Hazel? You're looking for a motion to ask GRE for the money? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do I have a seconder to that? Well, I don't think we've ever. Nathan. Nathan? Okay. Any questions? All in favor? In favor. Anybody opposed? Well, that one will be deferred till finance. Well, the, the motion is to actually have those discussions. That's what I'm hearing from Hazel. Well, in well, the end, that's what I'm hoping they'll do, but I'm asking to start discussing with them. We, we can't direct them what they can do with their money. Well, that's fine. And that's exactly what it was. Well, maybe I've said it wrong. But okay. So what is the motion, Shirley? Yes. Correct. Okay. So that was moved by Hazel, second by Audrey. Everybody was in favor. And Ellen, do you oppose? Okay. It was uh, Nathan okay. who seconded it. Oh, sorry. Already. So do you have a yeah, I wanted to comment first? Yeah. Hazel. I know we're very frustrated. When we talk about um, consulting with the community, we even did that. The entire community is what I'm talking about. We say that all the time when we're talking. We did it just a few minutes ago, and we have not done that. And I think we should be doing that, utilizing the strength of the community. I had mentioned to Ruby, in frustration of all these uh, areas of, no, we can't fund you, no, we can't fund you, four times. Is that right? Four times. Yeah, I said, I think we should use our community. Children, the entire community, school children, and we're going to Ottawa. We're marching down, up and down the, the track. That must be useful. We do think we're going to have some benefits from that. So I think we should do that in the city of Brantford in front of the government offices. We have to 
use our whole community. Obviously, this is very important to us, language, who we are. It's a foundation. It's understanding the ceremonies and what's necessary and inside and out of our uh, who we are as people. So we have a lot of language schools here, facilities, adults as well as children. And I think that you would have a lot of people that would take part in marching. Well, well they're calling it a rally now. We used to say protesting, but obviously that's sort of not the words we use anymore. So I think we should do that before we um, do anything else myself. We have to shame the government of their, their refusal to recognize our needs. We're talking of needs of transformation. Our needs in language is just as important as health. It is part of our health. If you we don't have our language, we're a little upset with ourselves and other people. We don't understand each other. It's part of our health. So that's my suggestion, that we gather the community. It's strength. Numbers are strength. And that we march in Brantford and put these kind of placards, like you're saying, fourth time, refusal. Put it on there. Who, who refused? The people that we've met with. And what did they say? You know, all those kind of things that are meaningful to the government. We need to shame them. That's my suggestion. Hey, okay, thanks, Melba. Can you turn your mic off? Cecile? Yes. And that the issue of private school came up. And we legally are not a private school. We, we don't have that on our name. We just said government school. The private got dropped because it was caught in conclusion. And the private stands for the accreditation of high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we Okay, I yeah. Okay, Alva. No, Elva, and I just want to reiterate because um, they can't hear you in the community. You, you, when you speak, you should come up to the mic so then it can be heard in the community. Um, so Elva was indicating that they have gone to GRE. However, they advise the board to keep going. School is a responsibility of the federal government and to continue to advocate there. So uh, I appreciate that. Audrey? Thanks, Michelle. Uh, our chief has been working on this for a long time, and um, I'm not updated on what he has done so far. So I see Christopher is there. So Christopher, are you able to chime in on this and bring us up to date what has been done? And are we any closer to getting uh, access to the excise tax? Well, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we did have a very productive meeting with the Minister of Indigenous Services uh, this morning. Uh, we then took her on a visit of Gawaneo. Um, 
there's kind of a lot that could be said about this, some of which I'll say uh, in uh, in camera, but um, uh, but the chief and I both felt that it was a positive meeting. Um, there were a number of creative ideas raised about how uh, we might be able to approach the excise tax uh, issue uh, going forward. Um, Minister Haidu uh, indicated that she uh, understands uh, the uh, the problem and why we need a solution and what the various benefits to the community would be from a solution to the excise tax issue. The chief and I both felt that she was uh, sincere. Um, and I think it's worth mentioning that um, a, a real solution to this issue would be um, not easy to bring about because it would it would uh, have a number of ramifications uh, on a on a broader basis in uh, in terms of the federal government's uh, budgeting and um, First Nations relations. So we felt it was a step in the right direction. Um, there's a lot more work, obviously, that needs to be done. Um, so I I can't say too much more beyond that. Um, obviously, only time will tell to a great extent. If we did get a solution to the excise tax issue, then obviously that would empower Six Nations to make decisions like this um, without the federal government's involvement, which would be the ideal. And Minister Haidu um, seemed to entirely get that right off the bat. She basically acknowledged that the excise tax issue isn't just about revenues, it's also about empowering an autonomous uh, um, Six Nations, empowering self-governance. So obviously there's a lot more that we'd have to do on this uh, in terms of an immediate short-term solution for next steps for funding for Gawaneo. That's something that council would have to discuss in terms of finding creative solutions. Um, Minister Haidu did say that uh, they were um, keen to explore what alternatives to the green uh, programming uh, fund uh, might be out there. Uh, and they and we in the chief's office wanted to take a closer look at this particular rejection letter uh, and um, have further conversations with Mike about uh, what exactly was apparently missing from this, because it's not apparent right off the bat why they rejected it. They said that you know, we didn't necessarily meet their concerns, but as was indicated earlier, Minister Miller had indicated that his staff would be working on their end to ensure that um, that we were meeting any uh, any requirements in the programming. So the fact that that wasn't met means that we should be exploring what exactly went wrong there. Um, so there's kind of a number of different things that need to happen on this front. But in terms of next steps for funding Gawaneo, that's something that council will have to discuss. I hope that helps provide a little more context. Yeah, now, you know, and that's exactly what it's going to do, but it, it's a process. It's not going to be happen overnight. You have to keep meet, meeting with ministers. Mark still has to do his job in trying to influence and um, persuade whatever else has to be done to the ministers to think that this is a good idea because Six Nations does have to be empowered. The language is so important. Our kids are so important. The culture, all of it's transmitted through the language. So we need that to happen. So yes, we will be working with you to try and make this happen. Because it's worthwhile. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you. You're welcome. So I have a comment, Danielle, and then over to Hazel. And then we'll wrap this conversation. I am here as a community member. And one of the things that I'm... I'm a little disappointed in the whole process is that Canada is putting so much money into truth and reconciliation. And this is exactly what it is as Six Nations. If we didn't have the speakers or the singers or the youth that are coming out of Gawaneo, we really wouldn't have anything. And I think that as a community member and a mother from one of the schools, I think we should be taking a step back and following what they're doing because the reason that they're not going to be a band operated school is because Indian Affairs is going to tell you who you can hire. They're going to tell you what credentials they have to have. And an example to that is last year at Jameson Elementary, we had a man who didn't have any culture, didn't any background, and he was teaching our Cuga language class to our kids. And I removed my child from that classroom. Um, I was disappointed, and that, that's a different step to take. But I think when we're thinking of language and we're thinking of what Gawaneo is doing, 
Um, I think that as a community, we need to, and, and exactly what Melba is saying and Hazel is saying and Audrey, we need to actually step back and follow the precedents that they're that they're putting in front of us. Because um, when you go to Gnosis and you see these young boys being able to, you know, um, say the speeches and sing the songs and and all of that, and then you look at the percentage of the kids that are at the other schools, and they're not getting, they're getting very little language. They're not getting speeches. They're not getting ceremonies. They're not getting the songs. They're not getting the dances. And with that comes patience. It comes um, the knowledge keepers that we're going to need. And you talked about previously uh, health and treaties. And if we don't have these young men and women that are coming up from these schools, we're not going to have that here as a community. So I think those are really key things to remember. The schools that we have right now, I would just suggest you as band counselors to go to the schools and see who's teaching our kids because the majority of the ones that are in Jameson and in and, and the elementary schools are people who may have status but aren't from here. And it makes me wonder where their, um, I guess where their passion lies when it comes to, to the language and the culture. That, that's there is really key points of why you don't want to be under Indian Affairs, because they're not going to let you have someone who's a knowledge keeper come in and teach them about the medicines or teach them about the song and dance, because that's why we're stuck in our system right now of being able to hire the teachers who have the OCT and have that number. And that doesn't make them smarter or 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 anything in our community. But we have people that are, you know, living in. Port Dover and they might have a partial status and they have a card and that allows them to apply for the jobs. And even at IL Thomas not too long ago, we had a non-Indigenous supply teacher come in and she couldn't even say the kids' names in the in, in the immersion classroom. And she started calling them by number. So these are the people that we're bringing in to supply for our kids. So like, I think that we should Come as a community step back and take precedence of what Galaneo is doing. And I just feel a little embarrassed and ashamed as a community member that they've been fighting for school this, this long and the government is putting all this money into truth and reconciliation. Well, is there not funding there that the bank council could pull from and just give it to you? Because that's truth and reconciliation. Revitalizing our language, our culture, and our all of those things. I look at something like the Toronto Maple Leafs. They all got those embroidered uh, beaded medallions and they paid probably thousands of dollars for that. And they wore them for their Truth and Reconciliation Day. We could, why not being approaching, approaching them and saying like, this is a better way to put your money if you're looking at truly building that Truth and Reconciliation, building allies. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Danielle. Okay, um, I agree with you, Danielle. I really agree with you. This truth and reconciliation was kind of like an overall promise to Indigenous people that things would be better. What have we seen that has gotten better? I feel like everything we want to do, we got to sit there and beg and beg. And in this case, it's been like well over 30 some years. And it's true, like the kids that come out of Gawaneo, like the little people who start in junior kindergarten or senior kindergarten, those little people can talk better than you would believe. And when they come and they do their um, ceremonies, um, their sings, I, I, it's it's amazing and it's it's um, heartwarming warming to hear them sing. And I'm going to say this, Bob, how they sang for Bob's mom. They did a tribute to her. And honest to God, the peacefulness, the kindness, the words, the songs, and, that, and it wasn't just one song. They did it for a good hour prior to her wake beginning. My heart is with Gawaneo. I don't want to wait any longer for some dollars. I just can't wait any longer. And um, to say that we got to go to finance. Well, we're sitting here as our council. We have authority to say finance. We want you to look into the fact of 
um, co-signing a loan for Gawain Neal so that school can start being built. Why, like, why would we even want to sit and wait for any more ministers to come here? We've already had Mark Miller and then today Patty hide you, and all they do is go over to the school, take a look around, and I feel like they could care less. In my heart, I feel like they could care less. So I'm, I'm pleading with the council, make a resolution where they can start the school and not have to wait anymore. It's already been too long. And like uh, Danielle said about truth and recon reconciliation, the government just uses those stupid words to satisfy themselves. So let's be strong. Let this council be strong and let's make a decision. Sorry, Bob. Hazel, can you turn your mic off? Thank you, Hazel. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think the council has always been in support. I know when we gave the $2 million, we actually were entertaining. How do we give you a loan? But that was denied. So I'm, it's really nice to hear that you guys are coming to council for that support. Because I think, you know, I, I help the other private school. They get ISK money too. And uh, we look at alternative ways. We don't want ISK money to fund. So, you know, we're developing that school with the funds that we have found. So, um, you know, we have to be creative because I don't think we'll ever get those funds from the federal government. So with that, I we had the one motion on the floor. I honestly think we need to defer your second one to Monday's meeting. Okay. No, I mean, that's this is something we've all talked about for years. And so uh, I even asked, why are you not coming back to ask for a loan? And the school could have been up two years ago. So um, with that, then, I really appreciate everybody being here. Um, and yeah, we're, we're here to support you. Shirley? Um, just for process purposes, if um, Hazel had a seconder to that second motion, it would go on the record. Without a seconder, it would just die on the floor. But if we put it with a the seconder, then it can be recorded. And it would be, yes, on the second motion. Or just to have it on the table anyway. Yep. Mm -hmm. No, I was when, when listening to Hazel talk about and Michelle talking about getting a loan. Have we ever approached RBC to start see if we can get some money out of them? Because you know the money they've made on the houses that people have went there, the housing loans that people are getting through there. And how many years have they been doing it now? Like thirty years. They've been making a bundle off of our housing. So maybe we need to start approaching them to say, hey, even if they just chipped in ten million or something, it would it would help. Like we need to start getting these people that are here in our community making all this money, not just Grandmore Enterprise. You have a bank in here that's making a fortune off of us, the RBC. Completely agree with you, Helen. There is a capital campaign that needs to be developed that should have been developed. I mean, we look at the Woodland Cultural Center; they're fundraising fifty-two million. Yeah. They have their team ready to go. They have their plans going, right? So yeah. there's everybody's fundraising. And, and so they're helping their own cause. So I, I, I'm with you there, Helen. Could Melva's going to have the last comp. Okay. Could we hear the resolution then that's on the floor right now? Yes. So it's moved by Hazel Johnson, seconded by Audrey Baum, Audrey Paulus Bumberg, that's the stations of the Grand River. Um, sent the request to finance for consideration um, to support the Galvanio School and their building project. Okay, I just want to say I certainly am a team player, and but I really get concerned because it's uh, the government's financial responsibility of education, as was mentioned by Danielle very well. So I will agree with it that it goes to finance. I will agree with that part. So for discussion, and I'm sure we will bring that up. 
established the first yeah, yeah, we have a few resolutions. Okay. Just, just when we would uh, expect to hear back from council on like going to finance, um, how you're going to help us like navigate some of the political stuff, um, whether or not somebody can be appointed to work with us, or like I just don't want to walk away tonight not having something concrete. Yeah, so my understanding, we will go to finance Monday morning. You have four counselors that sit on your board, to my understanding. They will relay that information to you as well as that follow-up to Mike and the next steps that he did or or what he may have to do. Yeah, yeah, you're always welcome to come to the council meetings. Awesome, thank you, Leslie. So thank you, everybody. And um, yeah, we will follow up next week. Okay, our next delegation. <laughs> okay, so we have Danielle and her colleague, Jeff, and they are going to be presenting the bridge program. So um, Danielle, I will give you a minute or two for you guys to prep. So in the meantime, council, can we look at the adoption of the general council meeting minutes of August 22nd um, as they're preparing? Moved by Nathan. Do I have a seconder? Second by Melba. Um, all in favor? Anybody opposed? Hearing none, the minutes are moved. And so you have the, you know, you have the overview and Jeff is out, also handing it out of what they're going to be presenting this evening. I think it's a phenomenal idea. And so Danielle, Jeff, I give the floor over to you. Welcome. I'm old now, so I have to wear glasses when I read. <laughs> We're not old. Okay, so thank you for having me. What you have in your bag is just a little bit of information about our organization. So I'm going to do this in 10 minutes or less, <laughs> because Michelle told me. Um, the other thing that I handed out was a letter that I gave to Chief Mark Hill back in August. You can see the date. Uh, I'm not exactly sure the date he received it because there was a technical issue. Um, so there's that inside the bag is a little information about us. So I'm just going to briefly, I'm not going to tell you everything because you can, uh, read it, but I am from Indigenous Sport and Wellness, Ontario. Um, I am from Six Nations. I'm Haudenosaunee, Diganyanyakwatnik Gyalso. Um, Otahyoni, Um, yeah, so I work there now. I've been there for two and a half years. We have two components Two is well, one is the sport component, and that makes us um we are the provincial and territory territorial sport body for um Ontario. So we are Team Ontario for NAG, we are the Team Ontario for NAC, which is the North North American Hockey Championship, Native American Hockey. Oh no. Sorry, I'm not on the sport team, but it's NAC and it's hockey. <laughs> Um, so we have that. And then on, we also have a wellness component. So the wellness component, um, began in 2017. We did a survey of all of the, well, we did a survey over 550 youth at the North American Indigenous Games when it was in Toronto. And out of that survey, it came back that 334 of them were from, uh, Ontario and they were all athletes. And what they said they were missing in their, um, Oh, sorry. What they said they were missing was some leadership components and almost exactly. It's really a nice sway from the last conversation to this, because the youth were saying that they were missing a connection to culture. And these are our athletes. So they're missing a connection to culture. They're missing a connection to to elders, to knowledge keepers, to who they are and where they fit in in, in our communities. So this is all of Ontario. And so we created the Standing Bear program. 
And what that is is a youth leadership program. So we now offer it in a three-tier program. And the first tier is all about the traditional culture and background. And we do not go into communities and tell them what they're going to learn. We actually utilize the, the knowledge keepers and the elders from their communities. And we just have a youth advisory committee and we take everything through them. So the youth are leading this project that we're doing and it's a program for the youth by the youth. We're just kind of like administrating the program and, and building it. So that's one good thing that's happening right now. And it's actually in schools. So uh, quickly we're in like high schools in Wallaceburg and in Sarnia. We've done a presentation for the London police. We're in Chippewa, the Thames. Uh, we're, we're actually everywhere. <laughs> we're in Kenora. Uh, the Catholic, the Toronto Catholic District School Board has reached out, the York District School Board. Uh, we're at STEAM Academy here in Brantford. We did a pilot with um, Jameson and did a plan to do a junior standing bear program. So where that helps um, our community is it takes out, like what I was saying earlier, it takes out that Indian affairs component where they're telling you if you have a culture or language teacher, they have to have their OCT. But a lot of the people who um, have that knowledge, you know, didn't want to be a school teacher, so they didn't go to teacher's college, they didn't get an OCT, so therefore they can't teach that information. But with our program, with the Junior Standing Bear Program, we can actually pay the honorarium for having elders come into the schools um, and deliver that to our youth. So that's where the Junior Standing Bear Program comes in. Um, from that component, the youth started talking about employment, and that transpired into the Bridge Program. And that little flyer is in is in your um, bag there. Um, so the bridge program, uh, Zabignagan. Zabignagan. So that is an Anishinaabe word. And the reason they used it was the young gentleman um, that started the program, he was Anishinaabe. And uh, he just used the language that he knew to begin. Um, like he just interpreted it from his perspective. So they created, they did a study last year and we had, how many, Jeff, how many youth were part of the, the program last year, the, the pilot? 20? So we, we did a pilot last year. There was about 20 youth and we created, um, we just gave them a whole array of job skills. They did uh, resume building, they did cover letters. And then we reached into the component of technology and they got um, some podcasting um, training. They got like, do you want to come? Or, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> come and tell us about the bridge program. Yeah, the program last year was really focused on digital technology and robotics and a lot of the things that, again, we take our direction from the young people. And uh, they would express an interest, um, and uh, it was a very successful program. Um, when it was successful, you know, we thought about continuing it. And 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 during the COVID period, I um, I did a lot of grant writing, and grant writing came up as a topic tonight, and I can very much relate to. Well, I can relate to uh, kind of the outcome of the letters and the bureaucracy and the lack of understanding sometimes when you don't get funding, because we've certainly got funding in some and we didn't get funding in others. But this one we were successful with um, and we got a fairly large, large grant. Um, during COVID, it was all focused on the movement of personal attractive equipment. And we had about close to $5 million in Unilever product that we distributed. I believe some came to First Nations, but some went on CN trucks up north and and then um, when you look at the concept of wellness, you know, we were told by the young people that having, having work is a really important part of, of their wellness and their well-being. Um, so, so there's a natural extension from Standing Bear. So we applied for a grant. Um, we, it was a proposal. Uh, we, were, we were approved to continue the discussions. We negotiated with the federal government, Economic, uh, Employment Social Development Canada, ESDC is the acronym that gets used. And, uh, and, and we have three programs. One is Community Health and Wellness, which is unique. The other is Green Building, 
where that was the pilot program as well. We've did a little bit where they were doing framing and all aspects of building structure. And then the third program is technology, which was was a focus of, of the uh, pilot program. So that's kind of where we, we are now. And and uh, Danielle's going to tell us why we're here. <laughs> yeah, so uh, what we want to do now is I was talking to Michelle about it. I talked to Chief Mark Hill about it. And we were looking at bringing the program to Six Nations. Uh, we've already ran one in Chippewa the Thames. We have another one at Losa is the um, the in London, the Healing Lodge. So we have 40, is it 40 youth? 45 12, 12, or 12, oh, 12. We have uh, 12 signed up for the technology program there. And we want it to give, to come to Six Nations, primarily because this is where I where I am and we're doing it as a pilot. And the other part is, is like, we want to be able to help the youth. We're all right here in, in Southern Ontario right now. We are moving to the Southeast region and up with Leslie, and we will be going to Kenora as well. Uh, our, our plan is to cover um, all Ontario as much as we can by getting 550 youth to take the program. So with coming to Six Nations, um, we talked about having a community health and wellness. And the other one that came up was the construction. So the construction component, uh, I did have a, we had a brief meeting with Helen because we ran into her at the cafe and uh, talked about um, the opportunity of, of giving some youth some job skills and um, doing the tiny home project. So that was something that we had already talked about doing from Habitat of Humanity. But I threw word that Six Nations is running a tiny home project or wanting to run a tiny home project. So that was something that we would like to start up with. But I guess the first part is, is, is that we just want it to bring a program to you. And we want it to let you know that this is another option for youth. Um, it's, it's not, it's very similar to what GREAT does, but like having the conversations with GREAT and um, and being from the community, another way that we can go, like it's almost like a step into great. So it's giving them some very basic job skill training that they can go and they can make, um, I guess different changes or more options once they get to great. So I've already had some meetings as well with NEPAM. So I've, I've been there and done a kind of, couple of presentations for them and we all know NEPAM, right? Yeah, uh, so we did that, um, and yeah, so we just, I'm just here tonight to tell you about our program, to tell you about what we're doing. Um, I know that Michelle's son was part of our team Ontario. There was quite a few youth, so uh, we want to thank the Bank Council as well from Six Nations for their contribution to their youth and supporting them to go to NAG. Uh, we also just had the Masters Indigenous Games and that was held in Ottawa. And that's for the 19 and older gang. But that doesn't exclude all of you. So I expect to see you all at the Masters Indigenous Games in 2025 in Ottawa. <laughs> we had, uh, you can do badminton, you can do running, walking. Um, but uh, part of our progress already has included um, an invitation from the, from the Mexican Embassy. And I was actually a part of that and they want to partner. And there is, you know, an agreement that Canada has done with um, the Mexican um, government on truth and reconciliation. <laughs> so um, there's a great potential for us to um, continue doing this and, and working with other Indigenous communities across the world to come to the Masters Indigenous Games. So those, it, it is really exciting. Um, and that part leads to the athletes that once they leave minor sport, where do they go and what do they do? So another component when we talk about the community health and wellness is giving them job opportunities. And we kind of were looking around focusing, what does this community in Six Nations need and what are we lacking? And part of that is like referees, umpires. We go to ball games, we have to bring people in to do that. So that could be something too that we can we can offer to the youth. It's a different form of employment, but it's still employment. Um, so one of the things with our funding though that we don't have um, is, is a budget for space. So in the letter that we have from Mark, that was part of it was we were looking for an in-kind donation to host these, these training sessions that we were um, hoping to have here in Six Nations. We need some, uh, a, a few of them require different uh, locations. Um, 
but some of them might be like at Dejo if we have space there where we could run a program. If we were going to be offering, um, you know, the umpires or anything like that, officiating like that, we might need the ice. Or maybe if it's in the summertime or spring, we might need the floor. Um, or another great opportunity is is being able to use the Chiefswood Park boardroom and being able to utilize the outside, like the grounds. So it's just all about um, kind of collaborating as opposed to deterring youth from taking different programs. And we all know that the conversations that are flowing, that funding does get exhausted. So it's really nice to, to add an addition to um, opportunity for our youth. So that's, 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 thank you so much, Danielle. Um, when she sent the letter to Sherilyn, Mark and myself, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And I mean, I think we always need to give our young people opportunity. And so uh, I really appreciate your leadership because uh, you held it together in Halifax for all our youth. And so not only Six Nations. So kudos to you and your team. So thank you both for presenting. Um, is there any questions for Danielle and Jeff? Jeff, right. So are you looking for a BCR or are you going to come back and give us here's our work plan. This is the space we may need because we're hosting these officiating clinics. Like, oh, oh, I really appreciate you making us aware of what you're bringing to community. Um, but yeah, that next step. I'm going to answer that because I've just been going through the process with the Friendship Center in Windsor for what the next step is. And uh, when uh, there's an interest um, and they feel that they can recruit 12 because the other responsibility of the host is hopefully to be able to allow us or help us in recruiting the 12 participants. And by the way, this is paid 250 hours, um, this particular program. Is we, uh, we, we, the first couple of days we meet with the youth to see what their interests are. And in addition to things that we're required to do, um, which is the soft skills training, job readiness, uh, looking at uh, even doing some exploration in their own communities about jobs. And what we found in the Chippewas of the Thames is they wanted to stay and work in their community. Um, so we're looking at looking at at what the opportunities are. Um, and then we would do a little bit of a, a scan to say what other opportunities are there in the community. And, 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 uh, and I read up a little bit about GREAT before this meeting. And, uh, and GREAT offers great programs. Um, what we would do, and, and and I just want to really emphasize the word that Danielle provided in her presentation, is we really collaborate. We want to talk to the people we're working with. We want to be able to strengthen the other organizations that exist in the community and fill the gaps if there are gaps. Um, some, some may take a training of ours and want to move into a more serious apprenticeship. We do not have an apprenticeship program. Um, so I'm not sure what Windsor will do, but when we were in Chippewas of the Thames, they really were interested in land-based physical literacy or physical activity. And what we've started to develop with them, because the sport world has traditionally um, said, children, if you want to learn what would be called physical literacy skills, find a gym, pick up a ball and pick up a bat. Um, whereas we found in the Thames, they wanted to run through the forest and jump on a log and learn how to swing an ax. And, so what we're doing is we're designing that whole approach, which is really, to me, an extension of storytelling, you know, and uh, and I'm talking about from four years of age up, and we're trying to look at the leaders who can facilitate that experience. So we would come into a community completely open-minded. We would see how can we help strengthen the community? How can we help um, the children, the youth become more physically active? How can we help the young people, um, A, feel a greater sense of belonging? And, and, and you talked about just kind of belonging within the cultural context. And then how can they be optimistic and enthusiastic about, you know, their passion and trying to find employment within that area? So we 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 customize the community health and wellness one. Green building, not as much. Technology, a little bit more. With building, it's people who want to get into the construction trades. And we can work with uh, organizations that currently exist in just spending 250 hours with youth to get them ready for whatever they would be providing in training. So... Um, today is just to say we're here. We're another organization who wants to contribute. Should should we be in a community that uh, that wants us to 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 help them fulfill their mandate? Perfect. Thank you, Jeff. Audrey. 
Yeah, thank you very much. That, that was well done. You speak very well, Danielle. Um, have you considered at, uh, adding financial literacy to it? So if they're going to make money, people have to know what to do with their money so that uh, at the end of the week, they have something left over, save a quarter of whatever you make, and credit cards. I, when kids get out of high school, they get credit cards and up to $500, and some of them never get out of that debt. Well, so, I wish my daughter had learned from me more about financial literacy, let me tell you, okay? Um, and she's 31. Um, yes, we will, and we have to. Um, one of the challenges of that, and I say this with humor, is our pilot program, they were paid weekly. Because they get paid through ISWO, Indigenous Born and Wellness Ontario, they get paid bi-weekly. You know, so some of them really had to figure out how they had to keep their money going for two weeks now and not just for one week. Um, we do. We also talk about a thing called challenge zone, which is, you know, there are things that give people anxiety and then things that they're bored about. It's trying to take on new challenges, but not being at a point of frustration or anxiety. So these are the life skills. You know, for athletes, sometimes like accountability for sometimes an athlete to belong to a team, it's easy for them to understand what accountability is. But uh, but ours are targeted towards the underemployed or the unemployed. They may target towards the person who tried out sport but didn't have a positive experience. So they didn't continue to participate or in anything which helped them develop as, as individuals. So um, we will start from their starting point and we will, we will work upwards towards hopefully full understanding of financial literacy and other, and other life areas. But that's a great point. Uh, I just also wanted to share one other program that we're doing is called the Making Tracks event. So it's held the every the second Tuesday of the evening in the evening of the month. Um, it's actually ran by youth leaders. So we have youth leaders that we pull in that have taken the program before. So it's a really nice circle because they come in, they start taking the Sandy Bear program. And once they're completed, they can move into something like the bridge program. Or if they just start with the bridge prog program, we actually incorporate our Sandy Bear program within that program as well, like in the, in the bridge program. And then once the youth are finished, we get them and we bring them back. So instead of me hiring an executive or an assistant to help uh, with anything that I'm working with, we actually hire the youth. We still hire the youth in between you know, 12 and 29, but a lot of them that we're hiring back are either in post-secondary or still continuing or just finishing that don't have um, employment yet. And they circle back in and they become our facilitators. So we teach them public speaking, they learn confidence um, and they learn technology along the way. And then they start delivering these programs for us. So we're always looking for youth leaders and every community that we go to. So Six Nations actually is um we have my daughter it's julie miller um she's our first one that has graduated from our tier program from our standing bear program and uh, she's one of our youth leaders and she comes in and volunteers with us so we just continue that cycle and then we would be bringing our youth leaders that complete our program and they get their police check and everything like that and then they go back into the schools or they go back into facilitating programming and it just continues to create a cycle of of support, leadership, and and wellness. Mm -hmm. But an answer to your question was was <laughs> yes, we part of the like having the ban resolution would be like if there's opportunity for us to host the program, it wouldn't be like a consistent year base. It would be about twelve. Uh, it's about eight to ten weeks, I guess, that we would need eight to ten weeks that we would need a, a location, and it would be like throughout like it might be it might be just like this winter and then the next one might not be till springtime so it's those we don't have the dates just yet um i do know that the construction one is one that we want to start start here um and i know it's with asics in and then and then ecdev uh, for the tiny homes project. So it would be like working with them and finding out what do they want their youth to have before they hire somebody, whether it's a general laborer or something like that. And then the training that we would give them comes with our partner from Elephant Thoughts. And then they would also participate in like giving them the falls. What is it? The fall prevention or women's training or anything like that. Those types of training they would get before even kind of going to a different apprentice or 
or applying for a position or a summer job at at eight six n or something like that. Yeah. I just wanted to add one more one more thing, and that's you know I heard this this evening, and I and I feel you know um, lucky that I was able to listen to the discussions on other council issues. I myself in recreation and sport development spent thirty years with City of Toronto and. You know, my proclamation is from our former mayor, Rob Ford, and and uh, I wasn't terribly disappointed to leave and move on with the next phase of my life. And my party was a re my my party was I called it a rewirement party. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. But I do want to say is you talked a lot about about not talking to the community. Danielle has been insistent that we come here first before we talk to the community. You know, and I just want to commend Danielle for taking that strong position because she knows how important it is to make sure that there's awareness of us being out there. And then all of a sudden you just say, what's going on here? And how great is seeing that we're competing and all. We don't compete. We collaborate or we go somewhere else. We, we do not have a shortage of communities um, that, uh, that, uh, that we're starting to get interest from. So we're going to have a little bit of a waiting list. And we're going to be moving around the province, uh, doing good work. But, um, but we, you know, we know how, um, you know how, you know, Six Nations. You know, and I, I kind of grew up in Toronto, and I knew very well about Six Nations. I mean, you are, you know, you are the First Nation as far as I'm concerned, and I'm talking about on a national level. You know, and uh, so I think it would be wonderful for us to be able to support you, and again, fulfilling your mandate. So. Perfect. Amazing presentation. So I want to also say that um, it's great to see that you want to build competencies in our young people because that's what builds confidence. And then, you know, it's just wellness all around, right? So really appreciate that. So at this time, I'm looking for a motion to accept the presentation, but also there will be a subsequent, I think we're going to need like a layout, a work plan of the date and so you can come back and present that or give that to Chief Hill um, when you want that in-kind contribution. So the first motion, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Melba's moving. We're accepting um, Danielle's presentation as information. Do I have a seconder? Helen, any questions? All in favor? Anybody oppose? Hearing none, motion is carried. Awesome. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's cool. Oh, sorry. Have a seat, guys. Zach has a question. My apologies, Zach. <laughs> all good. All good. Um, just wanted to mention that I would like to connect with these individuals as well, too. Um, obviously, we have a lot of departments at SNGR, and I know we have a lot of opportunities as well, too. And um, being someone, community member who's been supported over the years in my own education and then now have come back and worked for our community through the organization, I definitely see that need as well, too, to have our youth engaged uh, in the work that we do. And, um, yeah, there's an abundance of opportunities that we could provide as well, too, uh, as an organization. So, um, yeah, happy to connect. I, I believe probably Shirley or Brooke have your contact information, so um, I can connect with you that way and we can explore some other opportunities as well too on our end thanks sorry it's you gave me the mic and that can be a, a challenge but i do want to say you know what we were also told when we were in london and it was during the right time of year is um food literacy was an important part of it as well but they also went to new york to get out of a vault ancestral seeds and they and they planted them at uh, 13 moons land-based land-based um camp there and so if there's a need and you know there's an employment void in a community or where you need a skill set, you know, community health and wellness, we can tailor it and customize it so that we could help a dozen youth, you know, assess their, you know, very much focus in on an area that you think would be a great benefit to the community. Uh, we've introduced them to sustainable farming. When we took the group out to Halifax with us, we stopped at another place where they had a full program on you know, from, from farm to table um, food and sustainable agriculture. So um, we're really open-minded. Uh, we just want youth to, you know, whatever their gift is, we want them to be able to follow it and be able to be employed in that area. 
Melba? Yes, I didn't hear you mention Brantford at all. Is there any plans to present your program in Brantford? And the reason why I'm asking is we have a program right now called BRISC, and they are going to be a full-fledged friendship center once again for the city of Brantford very shortly. Brisk. Harmony Square. So we have, as you know, all the cities are the same. So many non natives coming in for employment and whatever reason. Yeah. So that would be beneficial. Thank you. Thanks, Melba. Uh, yes, the other option, the other opportunity I wanted to, or I wanted to look at, was talking to Sandy Porter too, and looking at the the people that are utilizing OW right now. And this is like a perfect opportunity for someone who's looking for this type of um, job skill, so that you know, like Christmas is around the corner, and you know, it's it's very empowering and and um, like builds the confidence right up of our youth. And if we're really trying to make changes in our in our community then we need to, you know, look at all different options that we have. One of the things I just wanted to uh, um, talk about Helen about was, you know, like when she mentioned that we gave RBC like millions of dollars over the years of interest rate, it's like a really good opportunity for bank council to to explore that idea. And this is not, is well, I hide my shirt, <laughs> but uh, like if we're, you know, we're, we're giving RBC all that money, like, you know, why are we not changing our housing structures so that, that in that interest money is going back in and then we would have the money to be able to just hand over to someone like going you. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate you both coming and presenting to us and I look forward to seeing what happens. And it's really nice. We are, I think, a very sports oriented community. So we used to have the Duke of Ed in the pro in the community. It's no longer here, and but it was more academic, right? More of those individuals I thought who were like more introverts. So you have a lot of athletes who I think are just wanting to play the sport, and will do um, some development, personal development. <laughs> awesome. And that was uh, I did have a conversation with Tracy and Jason Johnson too about about having the lacrosse be a good component around that career in health and wellness. So we're, what do our lacrosse players do once they're finished or, you know, going back into coaching and those types of things. And I asked Jason myself, I was like, what, um, you know, what, what made you be such an exceptional coach? Cause he is right. And, and I said, and how do we create more Jason Johnson's? He said, you can't, <laughs> of course, I wish he was here tonight, but um, he said that Dave general really helped him. And then I think back like Dave general was one of our chiefs, right? So it's, it's a really good opportunity that we could even potentially bring youth into the bank council who are looking to do um, this type of, of work. And how do we get them here? And, and how do we get them a seat? Uh, whether it's just listening or mentoring or, and then you coaching, you know, so, and then they can be your administrative assistant. And yeah, there's a lot. Okay. So with that, that ends our delegations for this evening. Um, so I don't know that we have any counselor reports. Does anybody have a report? Thanks, guys. Okay, yeah, I've seen that. So scheduling, there is nothing. Good night, safe travels. We have nothing under scheduling or community safety. I'm not sure that we've we've put anything there. So um, we have one addition, but I don't know that Hazel, it's an addition now because I don't know where Chief Hill is not on the line. Okay, so that addition will then be deferred to our Monday meeting is our next meeting, right? Is that next meeting? Okay. So with that, I am looking for someone to adjourn. Oh, one second. Oh, yes, that wasn't put on here. So Lillian was to speak to the follow up we gave housing um, two weeks to provide follow-up on the septic issues and it's a huge health and safety issue and I know the individual that you were speaking of today so okay 
Yeah, there is a bunch. Um, so Rod, are you speaking to the issue or I did see Lillianne Brooke, is she in the waiting room? No, he was in the meeting, but I'm not sure, but I believe Rod is here as well and he can assist. Rod, do you want to provide an update of the discussions that have happened? Uh, yeah, sure. So I, I know uh, Lillianne had wanted to um, kind of take the lead with, with the issue. Um, I understand just, I learned today that she and Peter Hill have been um, working in the background, I guess, to try to assess what kind of support or what are the circumstances surrounding, I think, up to four uh, residential septic system issues. Um, how I got pulled into it, I guess, if you go back and look at the, the minutes from August 22, I think it was Councillor Greg Frazier that suggested that um, the Mother Earth or the Environment Department also uh, contribute to kind of the internal scenarios or circumstances that communities are facing. So our mandate under the Mother Earth uh, Environment Office is probably more aligned with um, source water protection, more so than built environment. So I would politely and respectfully defer um, and one overstep here with um, the built environment. So that's housing and infrastructure. So I know Lillianne, um, it was probably best to speak in, in that regard. Through the course of my contributions that I, and I and I, I did send a, uh, a draft briefing note to um, the infrastructure and the environmental task force members. I didn't send it to full council, so I do apologize. We didn't have a briefing note ready for the agenda review team last Wednesday. So um, it, it wasn't circulated um, to your Dropbox. It's uh, It was just kind of a, a last minute um, addition, um, anticipating that there would be some discussion at tonight's uh, meeting. So I'm happy to uh, come back when Lily, Lillianne is available. If, if that's Monday, Monday's finance meeting, then I, I'm, I'm able to come back. But again, my contributions, I guess, are kind of secondary um, to the the housing and infrastructure context of the septic systems. But I'm, I'm happy to entertain any discussion now. I think bringing it to a finance meeting would make sense because I think there is going to be, there needs to be some discussion in regards to, are we helping our community? Because um, I mean, if Health Canada advise, and I mean, there's a, a fight there to get those funds from Health Canada, but um how do we ensure the health and safety of our community when they have sewage on their front lawn? Their little kids can't be outside playing. So it's the reality of what's happening here. So uh, if we can bring this, put this on for Mon Monday's agenda, Shirley and Brooke, um, and hopefully Lillian can be here. So thanks Rod for sticking with us tonight and uh, we'll get this discussed and follow up. Okay. Yep. Any questions? Okay, so with that, um, thanks everybody for being here and contributing. Um, I need somebody to motion to adjourn tonight's meeting. Go ahead, Nathan, Audrey, <laughs> moved by Nathan, seconded by Audrey. All in favor, meeting is adjourned. And we do not have an in-camera session, so have a good night and drive safely. <laughs>